On this week's episode, we'll be sharing with you the story of Charles Melville Hayes, a successful American and later Canadian railroad pioneer whose vision for building a northern transcontinental rail line took him to Europe, seeking continued financing. On the way back home from England, he and his entourage boarded the Titanic, which sank on April 15, 1912, after striking an iceberg. Hayes did not survive, but his legacy has, as well as one of his last commissioned locomotives built the same month as the sinking of the Titanic, but Hayes never got a chance to see in operation. That locomotive has survived and is on display at the Age of Steam Roadhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio, and we'll be paying a visit there to see this engine. So come aboard and ride with us as we explore another great piece of history on history and relics. Charles Melville Hayes was born on May 16, 1856, in Rock Island, Illinois. At the age of 17, he began his career in the railroad business, working for the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad in St. Louis. From there, he went on to be the secretary to the general manager of the Missouri Pacific and Wabash St. Louis Pacific Railways. At Wabash, he continued moving up in rank, taking over the position of general manager in 1886 and then vice president in 1889. In October 1881, he married Clara Jennings Gregg, and by 1896, he and his wife moved to Montreal, where Charles took the role of general manager for the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada. At the point Hayes was brought on to the Grand Trunk, though, it was near bankruptcy and underperforming its rival, the Canadian Pacific Railway. On the advice of American financier J.P. Morgan, the Grand Trunk Railway Board selected Hayes to bring more aggressive American business practices to the company. He recognized the management of the company and successively negotiated running rights with the Canadian Pacific Railway. He also brought more efficiency to the handling of accounts, built new tracks, and ordered more powerful locomotives which brought success to the railroad. At the time, the western prairies were being rapidly settled, and Hayes wanted to capitalize on that trend by constructing a transcontinental railroad. In 1900, he introduced a proposal to extend the lines of the Grand Trunk Western, an American subsidiary, from Chicago to Winnipeg, but he was turned down by the railroad's directors in London. Later that year, Hayes left Grand Trunk Railway to work for Southern Pacific, but a change in ownership there led to his resignation. He returned to Grand Trunk to find that the president, Sir Charles Rivers Wilson, had convinced the board of directors to pursue the Transcontinental Railway. Meanwhile, the government under Sir Wilfrid Laurier had also decided to back the project. Hayes' plan involved the creation of a subsidiary line from Winnipeg to Prince Rupert, with the government building the line from New Brunswick to Winnipeg. The cabinet, though, became weary of Hayes' demands for subsidies. But after negotiations between the government and Hayes, aided by the railroad's president, Rivers Wilson, the National Transcontinental Railway Act passed in 1903. It enabled the incorporation of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. The government's portion of the line would be called the National Transcontinental Railway. Between 1903 and 1905, development and construction began and was blossoming across the nation although it had a hefty price tag. In October 1909, Rivers Wilson retired and Hayes was appointed president of Grand Trunk, which also gave him control of its subsidiary railroad and steamship companies. Some of these included the Central Vermont Railway, the Grand Haven and Milwaukee Railway, 
the Detroit and Toledo Shoreline Railroad, the Canadian Express Company, and several others. Continued financing proved chaotic, and by the end of 1911, Grand Trunk was $100 million in debt. In April 1912, Hayes went to England for a director's meeting and to solicit financial support for the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. Joining him was his wife Clara, their maid, Mary Ann Perrault, private secretary, Vivian Payne, and daughter, Orion, and her husband, Thornton Davidson. Additionally, Hayes brought along Paul Chevray, who was the sculptor who created the bust of Laurier, which still stands in the lobby of the Chateau Laurier. He didn't want to stay too awfully long in London, though, as he was anxious to get back to Canada for the opening of his flagship hotel, the Chateau Laurier, in Ottawa, Ontario, named after Prime Minister Laurier. The gala opening of this hotel was set for April 25, 1912. At the director's meeting, he proposed to spend the company's way out of bankruptcy by upgrading rolling stock, double tracking, and by building a chain of luxury hotels across Canada, like his flagship hotel, due to open April 25th. He provided plans for six others, including Fort Gary in Winnipeg and the McDonald Hotel in Edmonton. According to Alfred Smithers, chairman of the Grand Trunk's board of directors, Hayes was supposed to spend Easter in Paris with his daughter and son-in-law, Orion and Thornton. But in a letter to friends in Montreal on April the 1st, he said that he preferred to stay at Smithers' country estate in Kent before sailing home on the Titanic on April 10th. As it turns out, Hayes may have also had business dealings with the White Star Line, as there were early discussions about speeding travelers from Europe to the Orient using White Star ships and his transcontinental railroad. As a result, J. Bruce Ismay invited Hayes and his entourage as guests aboard the Titanic. Titanic departed Southampton on April 10, 1912, and then stopped at Cherbourg, France. Her next stop was in Queenstown, Ireland, before heading west towards New York. Charles and Clara's ticket for Titanic was number 12749, and they stayed in first-class cabin B69, while Orion and Thornton, who held ticket 12750, stayed in cabin B71. Their maid stayed in cabin B73, while Hayes' secretary was in B24. Chevrolet boarded Titanic at Cherbourg via ticket 17594 and stayed in first-class cabin A9. Late on the evening of April 14, 1912, Hayes was relaxing in the gentleman's smoking lounge, speaking with a couple of individuals about the advances in transportation. At one point, Hayes conceded that while Titanic was a superlative vessel, he expressed concern that the trend to play fast and loose with larger and larger ships will end in tragedy. At about 11.40 p.m., Titanic struck an iceberg. Hayes never believed the ship would sink so quickly. As he put his wife, daughter, and Mary into lifeboat number three, he assured them that Titanic would stay afloat at least 10 hours. Chevrolet was able to board lifeboat number seven. But within two hours and 40 minutes, now the wee hours of April the 15th, Titanic fell beneath the waves. Charles, Thornton, and Vivian perished, with only Charles's body ever being recovered. Hayes' body was brought back to Montreal for burial aboard his private business class railway car CN63 called Canada. This car has been preserved and is currently on display at the Canadian Railway Museum in Quebec. And speaking of a preserved piece of history on display, the last train that Hayes commissioned to be built was this beauty right here, Canadian National 1551. Constructed the same month as the sinking of the Titanic, this 460 10-wheeler number 1551 rolled out of the Montreal Locomotive Works as Canadian Northern Railway number 1354 in April 1912. Number 1354 and its sisters were lightweight locomotives designed to haul both passenger and freight trains. In 1956, this 460 was renumbered 1551 and ran out its last miles on a branch line in Barrie, Ontario, 
before being retired in 1958. Soon after her retirement, she was privately acquired and was moved into a museum in Vermont until the late 1960s, when it was moved again to a new location in Pennsylvania. In 1986, Jerry Jacobson, founder of the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio, received 1551 in trade for another engine he had in his extensive collection. The engine was initially restored in Austintown, Ohio, and blew steam once more by 1988. About this same time, Jerry purchased 70 miles of the former N&W line between Harmon and Zanesville, which was later renamed the Ohio Central Railroad. Jerry ran passenger trains on a trek between Sugar Creek and Baltic for a number of years, providing an exciting once-in-a-lifetime type of experience to hundreds of thousands of visitors who rode behind number 1551. Finally, she was parked in 2003. She remains at the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, awaiting fresh restoration in order to someday ride the rails once more for all to see. The Age of Steam Roundhouse is a working roundhouse on 34 acres that you can visit and take a guided tour through. And we highly recommend checking this place out. It's incredible. For more information on tours, special events, and the like, you can visit www ageofsteamroundhouse.org Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you give us a thumbs up, a like, share with your friends, subscribe to our channel, and ring that notification bell so you always know when our new content is published. And all of this costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. The address is provided here on your screen and a link is provided in the description area below. So until next time, everyone, this one is history. Hey, and be sure to check out our eBay store under ID History and Relics. We're now featuring channel merchandise, starting with our new logo magnet. They're only $5.50 and net proceeds go towards supporting our channel.